Uh, my name is Dan Barrett, and I'm privileged and honored to introduce a very good friend of mine and a terrific trumpet player from New Orleans, Mr. Wendell Brunius. Well, thank you, Daniel. You're welcome. I was um, sitting there in, admi in admiration of your uh, comments, especially about Louis Armstrong, who, uh, without him, I, I really don't know what position jazz would be. I don't even know if there would be jazz. Well, it's actually. I know you'll agree. It's it's kind of sad that uh, even accomplished, even many accomplished jazz musicians don't fully understand what Louis did for the music, yeah. you know. And they give him a lot of lip service, and people say, "Oh, pops, oh yes, Ashmo, yeah, Louis, yeah, right." Yeah. And I don't think that many of them have actually checked out those records. You I know? agree with you. But if you think about it. Like, for instance, when Louie was with Fletcher Henderson's band in the early 20s, sure. and he turned everybody around just like Charlie Parker did later. That's right. And everybody wanted to be like Louis Armstrong. And I read, you probably read this, like Rex Stewart went out and got a pair of clunky shoes oh, like exactly Louie right. used to wear. Yeah. And Rex said, yeah, I used to try and walk like him and dress like him and play like him, and I, I wanted to be him. You they know? told me when Louis went to Chicago, he had a, like a box back coat which had gone out of style, man. Oh, and yeah. then everybody started wearing box back Yeah, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I probably would have done it myself when you think about it. But those, that band changed after Louis was in it, the Henderson band. All of a sudden, yeah, I mean, you've, you hear the records before he came into the band, and if it was swinging, it, it wasn't swinging in the way it was oh, yeah, after Louis like was there. I agree with you. Man. And then that whole, the whole big band era. See, people don't, they don't give Louis credit. He kind of founded the swing era. Yeah. Because Fletcher started writing those arrangements. We were talking about Benny Goodman earlier. Oh, yeah. And Fletcher Henderson started writing arrangements. And really, all he was doing, not, not to diminish what he was doing, but what Fletcher would do that made those arrangements so great is he was writing phrasing like Louie would play. Well, hey. They were pop tunes from the day, but Fletcher Henderson would sit there and imagine, now how would Louie play this phrase? Louie was had such So he'd write for five brass. Such a strong impact you know, on like, everything. Yep. Why? Okay, even well that's that? enough about him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's enough. talk about you. I heard a, <laughs> once, I just want to say this, I heard a professor one time, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, Louis Armstrong. The guy sometimes played a whole solo with one note. And I was <laughs> Well, wait a minute. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was, and I mean, it's, it's horrible to hear something like that because this is a guy that's teaching young people, hopefully, nice. to play jazz. Mm -hmm. And if you don't teach someone to respect and investigate Louis Armstrong, I don't think you're teaching them the right thing. Because, I mean, yeah. he, he was a force to be reckoned with, man, to say the very least. Uh, my brother-in-law, I don't think you've met him, Brian Shaw no. is his name. He's a real good trumpet player here mm -hmm. on the West Coast. A few years ago, I was at his house, and he had this, uh, well, it was a, a textbook, and it was a real dry textbook. Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but it was something like uh, Principles of Brass Playing in mm -hmm. the Modern Orchestra. I was talking about symphonic brass playing. And I said, yeah, what, what should I see about this? You know, it looked pretty boring, big mm -hmm. textbook. He said, well, look up, uh, I think it's page 288. <laughs> I opened it up, and the, the heading was vibrato. Mm -hmm. And in very formal language by you know, a professor or something, it's <laughs> it said uh, something about uh, the use of vibrato was shunned in symphonic works, and it was forbidden to use vibrato uh, until the middle to late 1930s. And at that time, and there it is in print, he said there was a trumpet player from New Orleans, Louis Armstrong, uh, who exerted such an overwhelming influence on brass players that the judicious use of vibrato is today accepted, wow. you know, at the composer's discretion, or at the conductor's discretion. Mm -hmm. Saying, wow, you know, so we're not just talking about jazz, we're yeah. talking about Everything. brass playing. And, That's right. And people don't understand that Louis was. Oh, I've heard this about Louis. Have you heard this? That, oh, yeah, he couldn't read too well. You know, come on. Well, 
you know. No. Was, he was sight reading those things, studio dates every day, sight singing too, not not yeah. sight playing. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Tune he never saw, sight singing, and he was he was on a first name basis with the principal trumpet players mm -hmm. of the orchestras around the country. Okay, well I guess turn into Louis Armstrong. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's just not enough to be said about Louis Armstrong. Yeah. Let's face it. Yeah, well, uh, my daughter has a little friend in New Orleans, and the the little friend's babysitter. Once I went to pick them up to take them for a cool drink or something, and the lady gets in the car and she says, "You know what? You're you're a jazz musician, right?" And I said, "Yeah." She said, I, you know, my cousin played trumpet. I said, really, who, who is it? She said, Louis Armstrong. And I, I nearly made a ring. <laughs> really? I said, Louis Armstrong, man, oh, I got the shakes, man. I bet. <laughs> my cousin played trumpet. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's know. nice. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, you know, Joe Smooth or somebody, you know. Yeah, Louis Armstrong. Oh, brother. <laughs> yeah. Maybe no. enough about Louis, even though there's not enough to be said I about I just want to ask you, did you ever hear him in person? No. I saw him yeah. one time. Did you? Yeah. But I never really heard him in person. Yeah, I never did either. Man. I've had, dream I've had real vivid dreams about him. I bet. Kind of funny, like hearing him play in, in these dreams. And he talked to me. Oh, it's really Ooh. weird. And he did it with John Kelso, too, mm -hmm. a young trumpet player in New York. Kelso yeah. had a similar dream. Like, it makes me cry to think oh, about it. He said he was sitting on a park bench and... And he saw Louis sitting on this other park bench. And then Louis got up in this dream and walked over and just sat down by him and took his hand and just kind of patted his hand. Like, you know, don't worry about a thing. Everything's yeah. going to be all right. Well, that, was, crazy, That's huh? got to Weird. be like the, the best dream you could have, I think. When I was a little kid, it was around 1963 or something like that, Louis Armstrong came to New Orleans. And this big brass band, like George Lewis and Punch Miller, my dad, everybody mm -hmm. went out there to meet Louis. And my dad uh, told my brother and I, he said, look, get some clothes on. I'm going to take you someplace, uh, you know. And we were wondering where we were going. He said, I'm going to take you to see Louis Armstrong, you know. Yeah. And I was, yeah. Or, I, I really didn't think I would see Louis Armstrong. But we went to the airport, and when Louis stepped out of the plane, man, that band hit. Oh, and man, a smile came over Louis Armstrong's face. He had a white baseball cap on. It's huh. just something I could never forget. Uh -huh. And he rubbed me on the head like that. Oh, said, hey, geez. pops. Oh, man. <laughs> that was that was That's one of the greatest guys. moments of my life. Man. I bet. Louis Armstrong. I mean, we keep saying that's enough about Louis Armstrong, but we keep going. Dude. Well, if, if if anything, I hope I hope all this talk, whoever might see this, you know, if if they haven't examined those records, and it yeah. doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what rec, you know, if he's on it, it's, it's going to be great. That's right. <laughs> you I'll know, it doesn't matter whether it's the 20s, or the 30s, or 40s, or 50s, or Whenever. 60s, you know. And what timing, man? That's one thing that you could get from Louis Armstrong, listening to him, the timing. Mm-hmm. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he had it. He yep. created it, basically. Hmm. But anyway. <laughs> well, I don't, what else do you talk about after Louis Armstrong? Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> Louis Armstrong, thank God, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, uh, but with, when you were saying with the young players, when he was asking about trying to get them, what would you advise them? about learning to play jazz. Mm -hmm. And you made such a strong uh, statement about learning melodies. Because when you, I mean, and you even said this about when you play a solo, it's just another melody. That's all it is. I mean, yeah, right. melody, by my definition, and Webster didn't have anything to do with this one, but yeah. I thought it was like a kind of, think of it as a series of notes that tie, you know, some changes together. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's basically what a solo is. That's right. So, I mean, to learn melodies, which I don't think we just, we don't accentuate upon that enough in the schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, my dad uh, had recorded a record with Paul Barber in, in the 1950s. Yeah. And one of, one of the cuts on there was, was uh, Bourbon Street Parade, which Paul Barber wrote. And what my dad used to do is like, he'd tell us, well, you know, I'm going out for a while and I want you to learn like Bob Thomas' solo on Bourbon Street Parade. Oh. And as a result of that, I can hum that solo right now. Uh-huh. 
You know, uh -huh. that had such, that kind of impact on me. Yeah. And, it, you know, I mean, I'm not a, like a more, I'm not a real older style player or anything like that, but that still is in me. You don't think so? Huh? Uh, well, I mean, hey. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> but um, it's like, you know, those, those, that's really maturing type of, uh, tactics and, and things to do to That's, help you to mature faster, I think so. I do too. Uh, I didn't know anything about improvising when I first heard these jazz records. I didn't know they were making it up out of their heads. Mm -hmm. I just liked the music, <laughs> you know. And then certain, I remember hearing a Bix Beiderbecke record and reading all the critics say, or the writers, you know, they say the same thing. I think one guy reads something and then he recycles yeah. it, you know. But everything I'd read about Bix Beiderbecke, they said he was fond of ninths and thirteenths. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. And then the next writer would say, oh, we like ninths and thirteenths. <laughs> yeah. And then I heard some record, I think it was Somebody Stole My Gal. And Bix plays this real nice phrase, and he, he went down to this kind of unusual note that rubbed up against the, the root of the chord. Mm -hmm. I thought, gee, that sounds... It sounds real strange, but it sounds real good mm -hmm. and real right. And then finally, I, I was, you know, the light came on that I should start playing a little more piano or trying to find out about the keyboard, which is some other advice we could give oh, you yeah. other students. You know, even if you even if you haven't studied piano formally, just get acquainted with the keyboard so you mm -hmm. can see chords and learn about changes. And I went over to the keyboard and I finally found out what chord that was. And then I realized it was it was like an E flat seventh chord. And Bix had gone down to an F. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, that's a ninth. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a ninth. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, light, 20 watt light bulb. <laughs> 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 oh, that's what a ninth is. Uh, well, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, that's a 13th. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I've heard him do that. And then, of course, as I mentioned, you know, when I first heard when I first heard Charlie Parker, and I'd go back to my Dixieland band and try and play like Charlie Parker. Well, then every solo I played, I had to I went immediately for the ninth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the banjo players, come on, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> ninth, 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 ninth. Oh yeah, thirteenth. Yeah, sorry. I want to get you to your gig. Mm -hmm. Oh, the heck with it. <laughs> <laughs> I just stay here, send out for pizza. Yeah. You have any uh, anything to tell the camera? Well, um, I've got so much respect for Dan Barrett that I would uh, I would tend to listen to you, Danny. Thank I'd, you. Uh, you know the feelings mutual, and it has been you. a long time. Thank you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to you. Nice to have this little chat. We yeah, can do this more often. I agree. Maybe maybe we'll get our own talk show. Well, hey. <laughs> Everybody's got them. Though. <laughs> <laughs> We are filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and we have with us today a trumpet virtuoso from New Orleans, Wendell Brunius. How are you doing? <laughs> Great. All right. Tell us, give us some of the color of New Orleans. How and why is New Orleans such a special city for this music? Oh, that, that's a big question. That's really a big question. Um, New Orleans is pretty much a melting pot. I mean, the whole, the people of New Orleans, the, you know, the Creole people along with the African people along with the, the real French people and the South American people and, and Asians that came there. I mean, it, New Orleans is, is basically an island. So when you came there, you were pretty stuck there. You know what I mean? So, I mean, not much penetrated New Orleans and it allowed what was there to like um, generate into what it is, which a lot of people respect and some people don't. But the music that came out of New Orleans was like um, music from all of those influences, the work song and then the Latin beat and the French uh, military music and all of that stuff came to be New Orleans music. And a friend of mine said this, uh, most of the jazz you hear today at Old Something to Congo Square. 
Uh-huh. You know, with, uh -huh. I don't know if you know what Congo Square uh, is. I, I know something, of it, but I want to get your opinion on it. Yeah. Tell us about Congo Square. Well, it, it was, I don't actually know that much about it, but it was kind of like where kind of slaves and, and people of color, or whatever you want to call them, kind of celebrated their rituals and parties or jazz fest or whatever they wanted to call it <laughs> in that day, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that's where a lot of that stuff was developed. And it was, it was not too uh, influenced by anything else but what was in New Orleans, mm -hmm. because uh, New Orleans was pretty isolated. That's the way I see it. You read these books and, you know, people have, you know, people fell off the moon and all kinds of different things. You know, everyone's got a story. Uh -huh. But uh, that, that's the way I see it. I mean, I'm a fourth generation New Orleanian, so um, I feel pretty uh, good about saying that because, I, I, you know, I mean, I had an old uncle who played with, uh, like, Buddy Bolden and, you know, so I'm a fourth generation musician also. And... Um, it's, uh, New Orleans is just a really special place in the world. I really mean that. It's just such a great place. And it isn't just the people. For instance, the whole sensational palate uh, is, is enlivened. The food. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the food is the best. I, I, I can actually say that a lot of cooks and chefs and stuff nowadays as soon as they say something Cajun or Creole, that means add pepper to you can't taste it. That is not right. That's not the way we do it. There. We have spicy food, but not hot spicy. Uh -huh. It's spiced with like three different kinds of bell pepper, shallots, red onion, yellow onion, uh, some pepper, quite naturally hot pepper, but not not this overwhelming thing and all of this burnt uh -huh. stuff they're selling and passing off as New Orleans food. Uh -huh. No, 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 no. <laughs> Something else. Uh, the brass bands were important in as a vehicle for the development of this music. Talk to us about particularly the African-American uh, tradition of the burial bands. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a, a belief in New Orleans that I mean, when you die, it's not like the end there, you know. So it's kind of like a party that we give the guy a send-off into his next thing, whatever that is. I mean, whether it's... Next uh, gig. Yeah, his next gig. <laughs> That's exactly... <laughs> I like the way you put that, yeah, his next gig. So, um, like, on the way, we uh, give respect and um, all of those kinds of things to the body on the way to the cemetery. We play dirges. And quite naturally, the family said, people who knew this person is sad. And uh, when we get to the, like, the cemetery, we play a nice slow hymn, some kind of mm -hmm. hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus, or, you know, goodbye, Charlie, or whatever it's going to be. And then we immediately turn around and start the celebration, because this guy has gone on somewhere else now. And uh, I think that's a really great way of looking at it. Rather mm -hmm. than dwelling upon, oh man, my brother's dead, or whoever mm -hmm. it is. Um, the family doesn't take part usually <laughs> in the celebration, mm -hmm. <laughs> quite naturally. But uh, the, the rest of the people just kind of turn him loose, you know, and uh, set him free to do whatever's next. And the music is a large part of that. It oh, helps yeah. them do that. Oh, yeah. So we, we hit up one of those real lively songs with the bass drum. Well, we're kind of losing that in New Orleans because that was a very, very respectful tradition at one time. But then all of a sudden, it kind of got to be less and less organized. Then you started getting a lot of people who wanted to participate, which is nice. It's nice people want to participate in. But as they participate, the real tradition is being destroyed mm -hmm. or, 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 or like diluted. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, um, like these kid bands started coming out. Mm. They were in T-shirts and jeans. Like whenever we had a funeral parade, everyone was dressed in a black or dark suit, mm -hmm. white shirt and tie, mm -hmm. black hat. Mm -hmm. You know, we that that's the way that tradition went. 
But now everybody's got their back, baseball cap backwards, uh -oh, uh -oh. and you know, and I mean, it's just, it's the the tradition is in serious threat there. Now and then we have a real traditional New Orleans funeral, but it's because these people are responding more to these young kids' bands, which is high energy, but uh, they don't have the proper respect for the tradition or for the purpose of the funeral parade itself, you know. And um, not to mention, they don't really know those hymns mm. because they, they don't respect that kind of music. And I mean, it's just like, you know, this is a fast world now. Mm -hmm. Everything is going really, really fast. Mm -hmm. So, in other um, words, continuity and change have to be balanced. Yeah, they they have to be. I mean, that, that's that's a great way of putting that. They have to be balanced. And if they're not balanced, it, we we're, we're going to destroy that um, tradition, which is in in a big threat now. We just buried a, an old guy from the Preservation Hall, Mr. Percy Humphrey, and. Um, you know, we tried to keep it as a traditional jazz funeral, but it was um, a lot of people started coming in there. You know, some lady in a flute playing a flute with you know with tights and you know leotard and all this kind of crazy stuff. You know, you know, I mean, she's got a right to express herself, mm -hmm. but that's not part of that mm -hmm. thing. And we didn't walk too far. The weather was really bad, and. Um, Everyone was, the, the crowd was, you know, like getting into the band, getting between the band. and stuff. Mm. You can't play that way, man. Because it doesn't take but one elbow, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. on the end of your horn, knock your teeth out, and that's the end. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's, it's just the end, that's it. So you have to be very careful with stuff like that. And if they don't respect the band, you know, or the tradition, it's going to be destroyed. And, and, and you know, and a lot of guys were like hardly playing because so many people were walking in and out of the band. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This makes a case for jazz education going beyond the classroom into what we call etiquette, concert etiquette. Well, yeah. But, and, but I want to say this about yourself and then uh, chime sure. in a little bit. I see you as being an important person. Uh, being a relatively young man uh, from New Orleans, restoring some of the respect of, of, of the music and the traditions. Yes. Do you see? Wh where do you see yourself? Well, I I don't feel I I am respected enough. Uh, like I, I don't think people look at me as real important. I really don't because um, I, I don't know. I'm not one of these real ultra. Uh, contemporary neo jazz guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm very much a pretty conservative musician. I, you know, my dad always was a great musician, wrote for Billy Eckstein, Cap Calloway, J. Mac Shane, uh, Walter Fats Pichon, and all these real bands, you know? And, and he, he just taught us to do what was right. Just follow your heart, do what's right, man. And a lot of times that gets, you know, not recognized in, in the world as we know it now. I teach at the University of New Orleans, uh -huh. and the response I get from a lot of these kids are like, oh yeah, well, you, you know, you're, you, you're playing old time or something like that. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty much a New Orleans and um, kind of more like a bebop trumpet player. So, which, I mean, bebops had the feeling, you know, still had the feeling. All of the, when all of these modes, like Dan was explaining, man, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that. I don't, you know, it's very, very like intellectual and and mm -hmm. really like, wow, man, that guy really must know some really high-powered stuff, you know, and you know, all of this stuff that comes from Vienna and, and all of these kind of <laughs> all this kind of stuff. You know, you understand what I mean? Not to put that down, but. I think jazz is like heartfelt, you know. That's an art from the heart, not not from the brain. And but this wave has happened. It's so big we can't do anything about it. So uh, that's why I say I don't feel like really respected or important in that way, because those kids that I teach and that I encounter all around the country, especially in America, 
the first thing is, I want to be famous. Mm. And, like, is that why you're playing a horn, to be famous, man? Don't you have something to say? This, this, this brings up another question uh, to put on the floor, and then you kind of jump in on that, is the heart of the music, I, I've always felt that anything that you fall in love with, it will reveal its secrets to you. I agree with that. I couldn't agree with you more. And this is like, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's tough to comment upon that without seeming like you're taking a shot at someone. You know, but it, it's not that. These, we have to get these guys to teaching these kids more about melody and, you know, just like Dan said, you know, someone may give you $10 to play uh, around midnight or something like that, but they'll never give you $20 and say, hey, man, can you play a Locrian scale? You know, it's 25 <laughs> bucks or something like that. And it just seems like jazz is going away from the heart, more to the head, and I, I don't like that movement. I really don't. I mean, that, that's just me, and who am I in the whole world? But I think we have to get back to playing melodies get back to drummers playing real time mm -hmm. and all this uh, blah, 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 and all this stuff great after you after the time is established mm -hmm. you know and all of these are crazy scales and way out stuff guys are playing great after the melody has been established mm -hmm. most of these tunes you know are, hardly have any melody at all man then some F Locrian scale. Castle gone, man. And you're like, hold up, man. Maybe I missed something here. Maybe I missed it. But I think we have to get back to beautiful melodies. And it just may be the era that we're living in that, you know, because so many beautiful songs came like like during like World War One, all of those beautiful songs that came like the teens and the twenties. Then after World War Two, all of these beautiful songs that came out when people were missing, you know, your loved mm -hmm. one is away, and mm -hmm. people still were really true in their hearts back then. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not too sure about that anymore. Uh -oh. <laughs> but all, a lot of that beautiful stuff that came out of that was the end result of those, like. You know, lovers missing each other. And, so, in know? other words, a song, a real song, yeah, doesn't just come because you know the notes and the scales and you can no, no, play no, no, chord no. X. No, 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 no. A song There's comes a, from experience. Talk to us about real experience. Well, experience and emotion. Mm -hmm. Emotion is the, is one of the main like uh, parts of playing a song. Um, when you, especially a ballad. You, you have to really know the words, basically, to the ballad. And the words, try, I try to make that come out the end of the horn. One of my favorite records, you know, when Dan was saying about Louis Armstrong, he's number one. Whoever doesn't think Louis Armstrong is number one has the wrong idea. I'm very <laughs> convinced of that. Because he, without Louis Armstrong, I don't know where jazz would be. I don't know, you know, I really don't know what, what could have happened without Louis Armstrong. But... I mean, you could hear the words come out of Louis Armstrong's horn. When you hear Charlie Parker with strings, mm -hmm. you hear words coming out of an alto. Clifford Brown with strings, you hear words coming out of the end of the horn. And, you know, this, that's why I think it's so important to know the words of a song. When you say, embrace me, that, there's, there's an emotion there, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that happens. And I don't know, a lot of that stuff today, I don't feel that. Guys are very excellent players. Uh -huh. And that's not everybody. I mean, this is kind of like some, uh, like, I, the, the wave is going away from the emotional side of, of music to its more uh, intellectual side. Talk to us about, I, I, I caught a couple of your sets which were just beautiful. Talk to us about your tone mm -hmm. and some of your influences on the trumpet. You've already talked about Lewis, mm -hmm. but who did you listen to to help you uh, formulate your tone and the way you play? Because the way you play is quite distinctive. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, um, 
my dad was a trumpet player, a really great trumpet player. He went to Juilliard Conservatory, and he played in the, like I said earlier, played with Cap Calloway and Billy Eckstein Band, the Walter Fats Pichon Band, which is a band few people have heard of, but that was a killer band, man. They played on the SS Dixie that went up and down the Mississippi River. Man, Fats Pichon was a great writer, and he taught my dad a lot after my dad got out of Juilliard. I mean, you know, you learn a lot of application there, but when it comes to really doing it, you have to, you have to just do it. I mean, you know, you can take ice, all kinds of stuff, put it together, and call it ice cream, but until it tastes like ice cream, <laughs> it's not here, I don't think. But, that, you know, my dad really learned stuff with, with that Fats Pichon band. That was a great experience for him, but he was, always a great, like, always went for projection out of his horn. And he was, like, he would say, just, like, don't blow into your horn, blow through your horn. Mm. And that, that, that's one thing I try to maintain. That, that's one statement that stuck with me forever, blowing through the horn. Then I had a brother, a brother John, who is a great trumpet player. Man. And, you know, my dad quite naturally had all of the Louis Armstrong records, Roy Eldridge, you know, Charlie Shavers with, with uh, Billy Holiday and all of that stuff. So I grew up listening to really good music. You know, I mean, quite naturally, like in the late 60s, early 70s, when I started, I was a little teenager and I started first playing. I played in all these rock bands, you know. We were trying to play like Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears type of stuff, which was, I thought was very well-constructed music still. But I had heard all of these uh, Louis Armstrong doing like I'm in the market for you with all of these beautiful high notes just coming out of the horn, just like, just like a butterfly, man, just shoo. And, uh, you know, quite naturally with my brother being in the next generation, Clifford Brown, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Kenny Durham, and all of these kind of guys, you know, uh, Donald Byrd and, Howard McGee, and all of these, my brother was in more of that generation. So I heard great music growing up. And uh, so when I, when I play, I try to emulate the best sounds that I've heard. And uh, that's what I kind of attribute my tone to. Okay, is there anything that you can give us a word on to get more music available to young people, so uh, jazz is considered only 3% of the record market. Yeah. To get more of this great music, which is a, of American heritage, on the menu. Well, one, one thing I can say is, I'm 40 years old now. No one wants to record anybody 40 years old. You know, once you reach you're 28, 29 years old, they take you off off the market just about mm. you know even if you had a contract so when I mean I'm 40 now so all of my experience and abilities and whatever are pretty much I'm pretty much at the peak of what I've ever played in my life right now but all of the record contracts are going to people 17 22 years old and you know Young kids, cause, man, this guy is going to be so-and-so. What about the guy that is so-and-so? <laughs> what that about is, that? That is a thought. You know? So it, either you're 17, you know, the 20, or you're 94 or something like this, and these are the people that are being recorded. Mm -hmm. And these are, that is not the best era of a musician's uh, career when you're very, very young. I mean... When I hear Winton with the Art Blakey band, he was playing the living hell out of the trumpet. Whew. Man, that guy was playing some really great trumpet. You know, so there are exceptions mm -hmm. to this rule. Mm -hmm. But most of these contracts are going to these kids. And I think that's why people aren't buying the music. The, most of the young people have, like, potential, but not necessarily that much to say right now. Mm -hmm. People will argue me, argue with me about that. It's okay, you know. It's, you have your opinion, and everyone has theirs. But you know, a friend of mine, uh, a certain record company, 
He said he was too old to record with them. He was 29. 29, a great tenor player. Mm. He was too old. And uh, uh, that's, uh, it was a shock, man. I was like, too old and he's 29, <laughs> man. You know what I mean? Charlie Parker was dead when he was 34. <laughs> You know what I mean? So if they would have said, hey, man, Bird, you're 29, man. You're too old, man. Just imagine all of the beautiful music we would have been robbed of. Mm -hmm. Just imagine that. Oh, Billie Holiday, you know, when she was 29, and she was doing all of those beautiful things, I love you, Porgy, and all of those mm. kinds of... And this is what's happening. Marketing is like, you know, taking the art out of art. Mm. So the music and the marketing are two completely different camps. They're just, just two different things. And um, like I say, a lot of people will argue with me, but a lot of the students that I teach, like I said earlier, their main goal is to be famous. Hmm. Well, man, I'm, working, I'm trying to get this contract. What are you hmm. going to do when you get the contract, son? You know, hmm. I'm sitting right here in the classroom with you. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when it comes to, you know, they can, if it's some, like, modal type of thing where they can just do all kinds of jazzy, funny stuff on their instrument, they do quite well. But when it comes to playing inside of the chords, mm. that's where they have the weakness. And I don't know, you have to know the rule before you can break the rule. Mm -hmm. And this is... Um, I don't know, just but for, I think we're going to have to record more people with more experience. This is the way these younger guys are going to learn, you know? But, I mean, a lot of those young guys get great energy. Mm -hmm. Look, I have a kid right now who's been a, around me ever since he was about six years old. His name is Nicholas Payton. You know of him? I've heard that name. He is a killer. But he grew up, he played in those New Orleans brass bands, and he, you know, he uh, used to come around me a lot, and then he went to a little school in New Orleans called NOCA, the New Orleans Center for the Creative Arts. Mm -hmm. And that brought him out. He learned his theory, and he, his guy plays piano. I mean, he's a great drummer, mm. plays bass. His dad is a bass player. He plays bass, like, unbelievable, and he's blowing a bell off of the trumpet. So there are exceptions to these things when I'm, that I'm saying, but we're going to have to start recording some more mature people so the guys will get an idea of what a mature player plays like. You know, Dan was saying, first he was trying to do all kind of ripping and running and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And eventually he learned, hey, man, slow down. Take your time. You know, and this is what the younger players are going to learn from the more mature players. And, I mean, like when you hear Doc Cheatham, man, you don't want to hear any more trumpet than that, man. Like he's swinging. He's just playing. I mean, there's just so much there, you know? And he's played like that for 50, 60, 70 years now. I mean, Doc is 90, maybe 91 now. So, I mean, you know, it's so important. Swing is so important. Mm -hmm. And swing mm -hmm. does not mean fast. Mm -hmm. This is another misinterpretation we get going here. Swing does not mean fast. Because... Um, a real musician, a jazz musician, can swing in any tempo. Can any he? tempo. I mean, I, I, Louis Armstrong could play one note and swing. I mean, when you hear some of the stuff Louis Armstrong singing, like with the Mills Brothers, just voices and a trumpet. And man, did those guys swing and play. If you never heard any of that stuff, get some of that. Unbelievable, man. There's one track on there that, I mean, comes to mind immediately is my darling Nellie Cray, man. Boy, and Louis sings the condensa on the end. That's <laughs> unbelievable. It's just so well-paced. Every, every zot, boop, bop, and everything <laughs> is just so well-timed. It's uh -huh. just, whew, man. But we're going to have to start really getting mature players to record. And, you know, we got a lot of established players that are trying to play like, you know, claim I'm open-minded, so I'm going to play like the kids are playing, you know what I mean? And I don't know, maybe that's the wave, but 
I think we're going to have to get back to melody and time. One thing someone said in terms of sh trying to show youngsters to respect uh, people who have done more than they have is that this little saying that says, a lot was done before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That sounds like a great parting line. <laughs> a lot was done before you were born. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And I know you've got to go. <laughs> it's been Thank a wonderful you, talking with Thanks you. Thanks to you. And I think you've given us some beautiful words of wisdom here. I hope so. And, and it, I hope it, it helps some guys to realize, hey, you know, maybe I had better take a little bit more inventory and uh, stop trying to be famous like within the first two years of my, you know, Playing and, and, and the art is more precious than the trappings. Much more. Much, much more. Thank you. Thank you. We've been filming here our Jazz Archive interview with Wendell Brunius.